All right, welcome back to another edition of Financial Accounting. It is Monday, April 19th. We'll start talking about Chapter 10 today. Uh, the extra credit project is due tomorrow. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, where people are uh, where people are at with that project. Remember that to get credit for that, um, you need to get at least 70% of that correct. And that's usually just done with by going right to the quizzes and seeing if you can fill everything out. It takes a little bit of time, so but after a while, I think people just kind of, they get the gist and they know they need to take a quiz to get points on it. Um, it there is what looks like a percentage on when you open up the project. The percentage you see in like the circle or whatever, it just tells you how many of the modules you've completed. <clears throat> you have to look at your uh, assignment results to see what percentage of the quiz points you've earned. So all you need to do is get at least 70% to get any extra credit points. If you get up to 95%, I just say stop. I'll just give you the 20, the full 20 points if you get up to 95%. Um, but get that, uh, try to get those points and get that done um, by tomorrow. I'm pushing off the homework for chapter, the first homework assignments for chapter 10. I'm putting those off to Thursday to give you guys some more time to wrap up any extra credit um, points that you still need to earn. We'll continue talking about 10.2, 10.3, and then all the way through to the end of the week. So um, then the next week, we've got Chapter 11. We'll just pretty much get through. We may have some extra time towards the end of next week to, to do any type of um, like pre-review for the final exam. Your final exam review, of course, will be Monday, May 3rd. Your particular final exam, you guys are in Section 006. This is you. This is when your final exam is, and I don't choose the times the university does. And don't you know? Don't stick me to a pole and set me on fire. 7:30 a.m. is when you guys will have your exam for this class, and it will be online. Um, it'll be basically like what you've been doing for the, the regular midterm exams. It's still proctorio. Um, <clears throat> you still uh, will log into Blackboard to do it. The only difference is there will be 50 questions. Um, at two points each. That determines 100 points for the final exam. It's cumulative, it's comprehensive. About uh, two, let's see, two fifths, 20, about 20 questions is related to the chapter 10 and 11. The other 30 questions is just a mixture of previous material. But again, we'll go over, I think we'll have plenty of time to, to go over some practice problems to sort of like refresh your brain. Um, towards the end of next week. But either way, just pay attention to uh, what you got to uh, do. Again, this uh, schedule is up on Blackboard in the course administration folder. Um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Are there any questions about uh, the remaining schedule for this class? Does anybody have any questions about uh, where we're at? I think we're pretty much good to go. Um, you'll probably see that we're kind of slowing down a little bit, so it's not as intensive. Um, chapter 10 is a little bit dense in terms of the concepts, but um, we'll get through that, I think, easily. So uh, you know, a couple of quick announcements here. So <clears throat> the uh, extra credit project, again, it's on Blackboard. There it is. Uh, all your assignments for the remaining part of the term are up on Blackboard, so you feel free to jump in ahead of those. Um, We'll talk about uh, exam replacements for the final exam and, and uh, how that is all factored into your final score. But take a look to see where you're at in the class. Go to the My Grades um, section on the left-hand side and see where you're at with your grades. Uh, the total class, total points that I evaluate you on is 500. So the points you've earned to date should be this third row down. And that, of course, is as of... Currently, it's being divided. The total points you've earned um, is currently divided by 386. I think that's the total max. Um, so in this case, if you have 386, you have 100% of the class like me. Um, the, the extra credit, if you if, when I factor in any extra credit points, you'll see a, um, an amount maybe above 100%. Like I said, there's a couple of people who um, are kicking butt in this class, and they'll definitely have over 100% um, showing up here. But again, if you have any questions about that, come talk to me. Like I said, we'll talk about the exam replacement here in a little bit, but there's the breakdown of your grade. Uh, we need to start talking about Chapter 10 uh, because it is the 
it, it's unfortunately it's the one of the chapters we talk about at the very end but it's a lot of the stuff that we have already kind of seen to some extent when we start a business and i'm actually helping a buddy of mine start up um, a couple not corporations but he's starting up a couple companies there are different companies you can set up when you file say you want to do business in the state of texas you would go to the uh, Secretary of State's website, Texas Tech Secretary of State's website, and you would actually um, look to, if you want to start a company, usually they have links directly there telling you, what do you want to do? Start up a business. I want to start up a nonprofit or a for-profit. I want to start up a for-profit LLC or a for-profit corporation. There's lots of different features of, of different corporate settings. We talk about in this class corporations, because corporations tend to be the more complicated form of business that's we figure if we give you that kind of exposure pretty much any smaller business like an LLC is not going to have a lot of complex accounting that you have you have not seen before so we can put you through the works in this class and that's of course challenging enough as is the when we're talking about corporations realize that corporations <clears throat> are distinct entities so you have a business corporation and there's a bunch of individual owners outside the corporation people who own stock and other mind you other corporations can own stock of our business if our business is publicly traded on the new york stock exchange you can buy stock on the new york through a broker then other companies can buy ownership into our company there are advantages or disadvantages of being a corporation just like there's advantages and disadvantages of being an llc or partnership or sole proprietorship um, some of those things we talked about, I believe it was in chapter one or chapter two. Corporations uh, tend to have some good features that you don't see at the smaller level, but they definitely have at least one major bad feature. So let's talk about the good and the bad of corporations. Separate legal entity. Some people look at these and say, oh, that's a good thing. Separate legal entity basically means that the corporation can get sued, but the individual owners by owning stock, you will not get sued. Okay, if you're just a passive investor, right, you're not the one running the business, you're not going to get sued simply because you own stock. A lot of people look at that as a good thing. There's a continuous life, right? Business these corporations, they can go on in perpetuity. So even if the CEO passes away, right, that's unfortunate, but the corporation will find somebody to take his or her place, and the corporation will keep going on and on and on. And basically, continuous life, it's not going to die away. Coca-Cola Corporation has been around for years. Right? A lot of corporations, Tootsie Roll Corporation has been around for years. A lot of these companies have just been around, even if their founders have passed away. <clears throat> Easy transferability of ownership. That basically means you can sell your stock. If you want to get out of being an owner of, a, say, Starbucks or Nike right, or Sam Adams, right, you can... Call up your broker and say, sell my shares on the market at whatever the market price is. That's easy to sell your shares. If it's a small company, a private company, then you have to work with a corporation to sell your shares back to the corporation or find somebody who's willing to buy your shares. And that's a, little, that's a lot more difficult to do. Limited liability, that's a big one. Of course, we've seen that with limited liability companies. LLCs are private companies, small companies that also have this protection. But it kind of goes along with this notion of, hey, the business is not the owners. The owners are separate from the business. So if the company gets sued, the owners don't necessarily get sued. Um, sometimes separation of ownership and management can be a bad thing because uh, people look at, hey, if, if the manager, the CEO doesn't own any stock of the business, and the CEO can make shitty decisions and run the corporation to the ground and say, oops, oh, I guess that's too bad. But if the manager, the owner, the, if the actual CEO or the managers, we just say managers in general, own a bit of the company, then we can say that if a, if a CEO makes a stupid decision, the CEO will hurt financially just like the other owners will. So we can talk about different types of compensation plans like stock options, for instance. This is the biggest downside, the double taxation. Corporations are a separate legal entity, which means that the corporation gets taxed. And then whatever's left over is the retained earnings. We know that. We've seen that before on the income statement. Net income goes into retained earnings. Net income is net of tax. Corporations are entities that pay tax. 
retain earnings are paid out in the form of dividends to stockholders. So when those retained earnings are paid out as dividends, guess what? They're taxed at the individual level. So it sucks. Uh, if I was king for a day, I would definitely get rid of this double taxation feature. It's just one of those where, you know, finally somebody actually gets money in the pocket from the corporate profits. Great. Here's your reward for being an investor and taking on the risk. Here's your reward. You're going to be taxed. But that, that amount you're getting is after tax, too. So that's why we call it double taxation. So imagine <clears throat> if there's $100 million, right? You subtract off, say, $20 million for the taxes, right? What's left into retained earnings, you get the $80 million. Well, if the $80 million is all distributed as a dividend, guess what? That, that dividend is going to be taxed at whatever your individual tax, uh, actually at the investment tax rate, which I think is now down to 20% probably too. So you can imagine like you know, subtract off from the 80 million, subtract off like another 16 million. So what is an investor left with when all is said and done? Now they're left with the uh, 64 million. So you start with 100, right? But what ends up in the investor pocket is like 64 after the double taxation. It's ridiculous, right? But that's the bad side. I say the good side is if you're to ask me in general what's a good side, um, well, <clears throat> it's actually not even listed here. It's actually if a company, if a corporation goes public, they can r raise a ton of cash in an initial public offering on the stock exchange. It's a huge one. The downside is really the double taxation. That's a big frown on your face right there. Government regulation, <clears throat> there's always some sort of form of government regulation. When you become a publicly traded corporation, meaning your stock is actually traded on the NASDAQ or NYSE, there's a lot more uh, you have to do in terms of government regulation, satisfying the government. Starting a company, I'll, I'll tell you this because I've, I've done this before. I have started a couple of nonprofit corporations from my spare bedroom in my house. And uh, it, starting a corporation is not hard. It's actually, and that's why I'm happy to work with you guys if you ever want to start a business. But it's really a matter of just kind of going online, filling in a couple blanks, and then paying 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or whatever. And then, boom, you're like instantaneously a business. And then the next couple of business days, you get a nice little certificate sent to you with like a gold seal on it saying, hey, you're now something, something corp. That kind of stuff is easy to do, right? It's what do you do after that? Right, and that's the accounting, that's the fundraising, that's the running the business, okay? Starting this stuff is not hard, but there's different terminology you need to be aware of. The corporate organizers are also known as what are called incorporators. They're the ones who are doing the filing online. They obtain a charter from the state that's basically the evidence is when you get that piece of paper up above saying you are a corporation officially. The charter authorizes the corporation to issue shares of stock. And the issuance, we'll talk about issued, authorized, issued, and outstanding, but a lot of you know, the, the fact that if you're registered with the state, you can issue shares to owners. That's just their permission, right? Do you need to be registered with the state? Generally, you just want to be because you're not going to find anybody who will buy your shares. Say, I'm a corporation. Someone say, well, are you registered with the state of Texas? And you say, no, then they'll just walk away. So you can issue stock, but no one's going to buy it unless you're officially registered with the state that you're doing business. There are fees that you have to pay. Initially, they're not too bad. Every year, you have to renew that. <clears throat> File documents with the state agree to a set of bylaws. And there's a lot of, if you ever go to, you can go on to, to set up all this stuff. I always recommend, if you go to Amazon, um, look for books that um, from No Low Publishing. No Low Publishers. They have a lot of how to form or start a, and then whatever it might be, it could be a nonprofit. I got that book a couple times. Great book, nonprofit. Man, is the author for that one, or how to start an LLC or a corporation or whatever. They have a lot of how to books that basically just say, here's what you want to avoid and here's what you want to do. And I think I love that because it's just like a reference manual for starting a business. Pretty straightforward. If you ever have any questions about this, you can come talk to me or talk to any of your professors about how to do that stuff. But I always, tell, I always recommend people, you know, don't think that you have it all figured out. It's a lot of times you're just kind of reaching out and asking people to, uh, to consult with them. But if you do start a corporation, realize you don't have to issue shares to the public. Corporations is a form. 
a, diff, a business form. The only the, there is, you know, tax implications depending on whether or not you choose to be a corporation. But corporate structure tends to be very diplomatic. It tends to also follow a lot of what we see in the politics. So if you think about stockholders, the owners of the business, right? <clears throat> That's like U.S. citizens. Okay, and every couple of years we're asked to elect government officials to the federal government in Congress or for the executive branch. So we tend to elect in corporations, they elect with our board of directors. That's, for instance, that's like saying a U.S. Uh, representative, a congressperson, or a senator, for instance. That's like us voting. Now, every shareholder, <clears throat> every share typically represents one vote. So if you own 100 shares, you get 100 votes. If you own 100,000 shares, you get 100,000 votes. So it's not quite like politics in the sense that, you know, politics, you only have one vote per citizen. In the corporate world, if you own more stock, you have more say. You get to determine who's steering the ship. These are the navigators, I would say. Um, <clears throat> but the navigators are the ones who give orders to the, the people who run the business, or actually go down and actually steer the ship. So you got chairpersons, you've got the, um, maybe you have a chief executive officer. Presidents, this is kind of weird terminology. Sometimes, like, you don't, uh, if there was something I could change about how states use their, uh, have their statutes organized, oftentimes you see the, these different terminology, these different terms for the same position. Oftentimes a president of a company is also considered the chief executive officer. And a treasurer is oftentimes the chief financial officer, CFO. So a lot of these different terms, pres I'm the chair, I'm the president, and the CEO. It's like, okay, a chairperson is the head of the board, is the one directing and organizing the board, get through the policies. That person may also be a chief executive officer or someone who actually is working with managers to actually execute the business. Okay? <clears throat> but that's kind of like where you get down to the, this sort of like level where you're saying, okay, if we got a CEO, chief operating officer, whatever, um, usually these are the people, this is like the, you know, your CEO is like your president of the United States, U.S. president, okay, and U.S. president obviously has a cabinet, right, cabinets, you have the Secretary of Education, Secretary of State, Secretary of Transportation, et cetera, et cetera, right, you have vice presidents in corporations, just like you have a vice president in the United States, so a lot of these people tend to be kind of like, these are like kind of like the cabinet positions, right, in the U.S. cabinet. Um, but again, these are essentially the people who actually have to go make calls, assign tasks, see things through, right? The decisions generally, sometimes this is just about executing on what the board has already said. This is where we're going to go. We need to sell off this division. We're no longer getting away for Pepsi company. We're no longer going to sell Pepsi clear. If you ever get a chance, look up Pepsi clear. It's ridiculous. It looks like Sprite, but it tastes like Pepsi. It's disgusting. Um, but like those, that's, those are kind of the major decisions that you would see at the board level, like major changes in how the corporation looks or where they're going. But who actually executes that order? CEO, CFO, COO, all the cabinet people go out and get the stuff done. Who manages the day-to-day -day operations? Well, it can be the CEO and the COO, but there's obviously a lot of delegation that happens. Controller, accounting officer, sometimes that can also be the CFO, the chief financial officer. It just depends. And isn't that person necessarily different from treasurer? Not necessarily. Like I said, a lot of different titles. But the bottom line is the key thing to take away from this is that there's a clear delineation right here, I would say, between the outsiders and the insiders. And even to some extent, you can see the board of directors is generally comp is comprised of people who work outside who are not necessarily employed in the business, but that's sort of like the hierarchy. It's very diplomatic, um, but you can have people who have huge chunks, blocks of ownership. And by the way, this is also something I want to know too. Um, how much influence, how much in shares can I own to actually have some influence on a corporation, right? Now, some of you out there may have parents who own Microsoft stock or Dell stock or, or Starbucks or Nordstrom's or Nike, right? How much stock should I own where I can actually have an influence on the corporation? <clears throat> Obviously, if you own 51% or more of outstanding stock, you are in control. 
generally speaking, all states say that's the majority, that's the person who basically runs the company. But a person who owns at least, I would say, 5% of the outstanding stock generally starts having a lot of play in the business, even maybe to the extent of 3%. But 5% makes you what's called a block holder. And that's where you can have influence. And the reason why you have influence, you may not be able to have your vote count of, above and beyond someone who owns 51%. That's obvious. But if you own 5%, the power that you have as a block holder is that you can sell your stock. And when you sell 5% of the outstanding shares like on the market right away, stock price takes a huge decline. People start panicking. And that hurts all the other 95% owners. Anyways, so what are the different rights of being a stockholder? There's four basic rights, we would say. Um, if you own common stock in general, that means you have the right to vote. One, one stock, one share means one vote. You have the right to receive a portion of any dividend that's outstanding. So if you're a 5% owner, you'll get 5% of the dividends um, that are sent out to you to be common stockholders. You can receive a proportionate share of any assets remaining upon liquidation, and that essentially means bankruptcy now I will tell you this too that, that usually what happens is in the case where we are selling a business assets equals liabilities plus equity but usually the assets primarily go to the liability uh, the creditors first there may not be that much left over for the stockholders when there's the company is liquidated <clears throat> the reason why is because book value does not mean uh, market value. Uh, here's another key one. Maintain one's proportionate ownership in a corporation called a preemptive right. I'll, there's always a question on the final about some sort of preemptive right. Preemptive right basically means if I'm a 5% owner and I own, say, 100,000 shares, okay, if the corporation decides to issue more shares, I get to maintain my 5%, which means I may have to buy, say, another um, 50,000 shares. I have dibs. I have the right to keep my 5%. And if that means the corporation is you know, issuing 50% you know, more outstanding stock, then I have the right to buy 50, my 50,000 shares because now 150,000 shares represents the outstanding shop stock so it's all about the percentage of the pie the pie might get the pie may be like you own this slice right and that may be the hundred thousand shares you own but the company wants to get a little bit bigger how do you maintain your five percent well you have to buy more stock so now that five to maintain that five percent you have to have 150,000 shares how do you how do you maintain that five percent if the company wants to issue more stock well states state uh, statutes say you have the preemptive right to maintain that 5%. You don't have to buy 50,000 more shares, but you have the first, you have the right to, to, to decline that. So no, no public offerings are made um, that could potentially dilute shareholders um, away. And there's, if you want to know about uh, stock holding dilution and the risk associated with that, watch that movie called The Social Network about Facebook and see what happened to one of the founders when um, the company decided to go public. He was screwed out of his shares. Actually, they went. They issued a ton of new stock, and he ended up with like this even itty bitty small amount. So he had like no power after that. He was screwed over. Key thing to realize about being a stockholder is you're kind of a peasant. Okay, you're, you're a commoner. Um, you have an ownership stake in the company. You are a residual claimant for any net assets if the company goes bankrupt. Um, they are the owners, they have the voting rights, but it is possible that the company has this other class called preferred stock, which is kind of like, you know, snobbish hoity-toity royalty, getting their preferred um, shares before the commoners. It's not really about who gets their shares. The real distinction here has to deal with dividends. That's the key distinction. If there is preferred stock, which you don't really see too much nowadays. But if a corporation issues common stock, that's going to the public usually. Preferred stock is usually issued to private investors, people who are just purely passive. They don't want to run the business. They don't want to have a vote. They just basically want to be guaranteed their dividend 
first above whatever the company is paying out to the commoner. So it's kind of like the commoners get the scraps, preferred shareholders are just first in line to get the dividends. Okay? But you don't really see preferred stock too much. There are, of course, questions we have to ask on the final exam about preferred shareholders. But common stock is really the most is the most common type of uh, ownership you see out there. That's why they typically call it common stock. It's the standard baseline way of, of owning a company. Common stock, ha there's a lot of different terms that we have to be familiar with with common stock. The first one I would say is knowing um, the difference between par value and no par. Par value, this is kind of ridiculous, but essentially states a long time ago, they require a company to um, attach some value to a stock certificate. So when a company wants to issue stock, pieces of paper to the public and, and sell those, usually states require that there's some sort of minimum value for that piece of paper. That's not necessarily the value that a, a shareholder will pay to, to buy the stock, but usually what you might see is maybe a penny per share or even a fraction of a penny per share just to, to represent some sort of like legal minimum capital that the company must maintain. And this is just to protect the ownership. So if a company, like say, for instance, uh, Enron or even Washington Mutual, when they essentially went under, um, their stock traded down into the pennies, but it was never below like a minimum par value because the state requires that there's going to be some little piece of money attached to the piece of paper that has nothing to do with the market. It's a bare minimum value of what the paper is worth and it's ridiculously low and it causes frustrations for you guys in this class because we have to worry about it. I, I see a lot of more states allowing no par stock where you don't have to worry about distinguishing par value from what people pay and so we'll go through these examples but um, you don't really see it too much today, but more and more states are permitting companies to issue no par value common stock. Again, par value is just a statutory minimum value attached to this stuff. So there's pros and cons um, with equity, but, but it, you have to be able to take a step back and say, didn't we just talk about bonds and owning bonds of a corporation? I mean, if I'm a bondholder, well, why should I buy stock if I can own bonds? Bonds guarantee me interest. Yes, legally your guaranteed interest. Bonds can also be, also be traded on a bond market the same way stocks are traded on a stock market. Why would I want to be a stockholder where I get like the scraps potentially if a company goes bankrupt? Well, the answer to that is really there's unlimited potential for a return if you're a stockholder. Um, but really at the end of the day, whether or not it's uh, we, whether or not equity or debt is which one's more beneficial, it depends on whether or not you're the company issuing the stock whether or not you're the investor investing in the stock or bonds. And so when we go through these, just kind of realize, you know, we're, we need to be able to, to, to see these things objectively. It's just a form of investment. The company needs to raise money to start go, to either expand or just to get going, just to start its business. So issuing stock is just a way of raising money, just like borrowing money from bonds or from a note payable is a way to raise money. Company can re, um, so stocks and preferred stock. Company repays initial investment to investor. No, generally that's a, a benefit above, above bonds and notes because once we issue the stock and we take people's money, we don't have to give it back ever, right? You can trade your stock on a stock market and get your money back that way if you're an investor. But you know, as far as like um, uh, companies concerned, they don't have to pay back that cash. As opposed to bonds. Yes, we do have to pay back the principal, right? Or the face value. So depending on that could be good or bad. It just depends on your perspective. Um, obligated to pay dividends. No. Obligated to pay dividends. Not really dividends. Interest. Yes. So we don't pay dividends on debt. We pay interest on debt. Yes, we're obligated legally to pay interest. No, we're not obligated to pay dividends. That's a decision of the board of directors. The board of directors decides whether not to pay a dividend. Microsoft for years did not pay dividends. And the reason why is because they just wanted to keep the money to help grow the business. Um, tax deduction for dividends. Okay, so if the company decides to pay out dividends, it has no, there's no tax benefit associated with that. 
But is there a tax deduction for um, paying out dividends? Nah, interest. My bad on that typo. Is there a tax deduction for paying interest? Yes, you can. You can. That's one reason why companies do enjoy um, having debt. Is that any type of money that they pay out returns? We call interest as a return on your investment. That is actually deductible. Dividends is more like they don't really consider it's not really a it's not like an operating type of an expense. It's considered a return, uh, like a return of capital. And the reason why is that as the company grows because of net income, essentially the value of the company is the net worth of the company is getting bigger, right? Remember that retained earnings is just that big bag, right? And over time, that bag gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Well, that retained earnings is just part of stockholders' equity. It's just part of the net assets of the business. So if any money is paid out, it's considered just a return of capital. Um, to the owners. It's not considered an operating thing. And truth be told, too, it because it's so discretionary, um, there should be no tax benefit associated with it because companies don't have to pay it out. They can just decide whether or not to. Legally, we must pay interest because that's part of the notes and part of the bonds. Stockholders' equity. This is all. This whole chapter is about stockholders' equity. There are core accounts that we have to be aware of. A lot of the stuff you already know. There's a couple things that are new. Paid in capital. I think that the book sort of confuses this a little bit too much because paid in capital basically means uh, common stock and any amount paid above stock. This is your paid in capital. This is how much money people paid into the business in total. If there is a par value associated with the common stock, we have to separate that out from the excess that people pay, the additional paid in capital. So it's the amount of stockholders uh, that have contributed or paid into the corporation. Um, it includes the core stock accounts, which would be like par or par value, and any amount above that one penny per share. So what we call additional paid in capital, that's the amount that people pay above and beyond that legal minimum one penny per share. And that's obviously the huge amount. Retained earnings, you know what that is. It's the... Um, Essentially, it's the total amount of net income that the company's um, built over time minus all the dividends. So that's not, it, but it is part of the core accounts. Okay. So do we? How does this look overall? We want to kind of keep this big picture in mind. This, these are the ledger accounts. Okay? This is where all the accounting essentially is affected. But how do we report that? Well, we tend to show on the balance sheet in its own section, stockholders' equity, a couple different lines. If we have a par value for common stock at a penny per share. We'll keep that separate from any amount people paid above and beyond that. So in this case, if people paid us cash of $10,000, right, to invest to start the business, but only there's only a certain amount of penny per share associated with par value, we just need to separate it out between what is additional, sometimes called additional paid in capital or just paid in capital excess of par. You see it in different ways. The book is just, uh, not very consistent with it. Paid in capital and in excess of par, additional paid in capital, any amount above par value. We'll look at examples here. They have to separate that out. Authorize. Here's always some key questions for the exam. I'm always asking questions like, what's the difference between authorized, issued, and outstanding? Authorized is a maximum number of shares a company can issue under its charter, right? Because So it could be like 25 billion shares. Right, but is the company going to issue 25 billion shares? No, it just can if it wants to. It's just like, you know, wishing for unlimited amount of wishes. Right, issued is the actual amount that's been sent out to the individual stockholders for cash. We issued stock for cash. Okay, and that could be, say, for instance, like just 100,000 shares. We don't have to issue the full 25 billion. So. And if we want to have a secondary equity offering or a third equi uh, equity offering, we can do that. Okay, but the maximum number we're going to ever issue is 25 billion shares. Outstanding means the number of shares that are currently being held by outside stockholders. And there's a difference between, we'll talk about treasury stock here in a little bit. So we've got a bunch of these different terms. We just want to kind of keep them separate. I say, hey, let's go through examples. Examples are always the key thing to, to kind of help sort out this stuff. Most of the time when we issue stock, 
we're issuing a price well above par value. But let's assume that for just for the moment that we establish legally when we set up our corporation, we said we're going to issue stock and the par value is say $10 per share. You don't see that hardly ever, but let's just say for now we do that. When we issue the stock out to the public, right, we want to issue a thousand shares and we're going to ask people to pay us $10 per share. That seems like a reasonable price. That amount is really based on the market, what the market is demanding or market price. So we say issue price, it's the same thing as basically the same market price. It's what someone's willing to pay who wants to own the business. Par value is a legal minimum amount. So what's the journal entry? The journal entry is based off of that market price, $10 per share. That's how much they gave us times 1,000 shares, $10,000. We need to be careful about how to split that. If there is a par value, we're going to start by first saying the par value times the number of shares issued is how much goes to the common stock account. And sometimes it's called common stock par or just call it common stock. Common stock is usually what people or what we call the place where we put all the par value. So it's a pretty basic um, baseline scenario. We got the cash, we issued stock, there's no additional paid in capital. Above that, our stockholders equity on the balance sheet looks pretty simple. $10 par, 50,000 shares authorized, how much do we actually issue? A thousand. We can issue up, we can issue another 49,000 if we want. But right now we're just kind of taking it slow, put out a thousand, people want to buy it, maybe later we issue out some more. There's the 10,000, let's assume we have retained earnings of 7,000, just for an example there. <laughs> Total stockholders equity is the sum of those two. Okay? Basic, baseline example. Next example, we want to see the more typical situation when the company has their initial public offering, their IPO. They issue out the stock. Generally, it's through a bunch of underwriters to find investors. We issue a thousand shares, but this time it's the one penny per share legal minimum amount attached. The market price is $10 per share. I think on average, I saw this a while ago, the, statistically, um, over the past 20 years, when people have IPOs, they start off as a minimum, usually around $20 per share. It, but, you know, of course, people run it up for very quickly. But initial price can be somewhere around 20 bucks per share. Jim Cramer <clears throat> is the host of CNBC's Mad Money. And he actually, in his book, um, Confessions of a Wall Street Addict, uh, uh, admits that there's probably no real science to determining how much uh, we should issue these shares for. It just sort of depends on what investors are willing to pay. The initial investors in the primary market. If we find people who are willing to pay $10 per share, we should, could we have gotten more? Maybe, right? But usually that there's no real science to this. They just, I swear to God, I think they just throw it at a dartboard and say $10 per share. We get $10 per share. That's the market price. That's how much cash we get. In this case, we want to start first by crediting common stock for the par value. One cent per share times a thousand shares. I believe that's ten dollars per share. What is the remaining credit? It's just a plug figure. We call it paid in capital or call it additional paid in capital. Sometimes you see that or paid in capital in excess of par. Um, it's just the excess. Common stock is the core par. The other paid in capital account is for the remaining portion. So we're just going to split those up. Now, how is this really different from the previous example? It's still a full $10,000 in paid in capital. <clears throat> but we have to split it between what is the legal minimum amount, par, and the rest just being APEC or additional paid in capital. That's the typical situation. And by and large, if you look at any corporation's stockholders equity section, their, their paid in capital or additional paid in capital tends to be the largest. Um, um, amount that you see the common stock is really really small and that's just and that's what what's is there any real mark someone usually asks me is there any like downside to that there isn't not really um in this case we say no par value of common stock this is a beautiful situation because we just threw it all inside the common stock account 
Uh, they pay us ten dollars per share. We just call it all just common. Stock. So it's almost like we're saying the market is determining what par value is, but legally speaking, there's no par value. So just plug it all into common stock, and therefore it looks a lot like the first example that we just saw. It's all just going to go into the common stock account. No real magic there. Um, it is possible that we you don't see this very often, but I have to talk about it because you know, there may be an exam question about this. What if we issue stock, but instead of getting cash, we get something else? Well, if we get equipment, right, then we just debit the equipment account, but we do it for the fair value. This is the key thing. What's the fair value of the equipment that we're getting? What's the Craigslist or what's the Kelly Blue Book value or whatever we pay? You know, what would we have to pay for this equipment if we want to pay cash, right? That usually determines first how much value we receive. Then we have to split it between common stock and then any type of additional paid and cap and plug figure. That's possible. It's rarely seen. It's also possible that we issue stock for legal services or any, or even accounting services. Something where you know I help you know I my buddy's starting his business and I'm helping him with that and he says, "Do you want to be an owner?" I'm like, "No, I'm not going to invest in your business. We'll help you get it going." And he even asked me too, he said, you know, we issue some um, ownership interest in our business. And I said, no, nah, just keep it because, you know, it's not really, I'm not trying to, I don't want to, you know, have that sort of kind of stake or claim in a business. But if I did provide any consulting services, I could say, rather than charge them cash, I can say, just give me some shares of your business, in which case there would probably be some sort of hourly rate or I can say my consulting services are worth in total over the past six months ten thousand dollars I would say and so I'll send you an invoice for that here's how many hours I worked here's my hourly rate pay, you know pay me this but pay me in stock I can do that as well if they do that it's going to be for them a legal expense on the income statement that's the key thing there so they're not really getting um, cash they're not really getting any asset at all but they are getting something of value and that's why I always look at expenses and say expenses are not really a bad thing. They just represent the value that has been consumed. I could have paid cash for this, but instead I just basically issued stock. So that can be a way of preserving cash. Major there. Uh, preferred stock, we'll talk more about this stuff as we go um, further and further into the chapter. But preferred stock, and when we issue uh, preferred stock, it's very similar to common stock. So say we would just debit cash. And we just credit um, preferred stock. So we wouldn't call it common stock, we just call it preferred stock. Similar thing. If there may be, is there a par value associated with preferred stock? Maybe. If there is, we would have preferred stock par value, and we'd have paid in, uh, additional paid in capital for, per, for preferred stock. But it's it's not that much different. Okay. The only real difference with preferred stock is. Usually people buy preferred stock or invest in preferred stock because there's a guaranteed dividend, you know, if there's a and they're first in line. Some stock preferred stock can be issued with a conversion feature. So we can it, we maybe we start off as a passive investor, but maybe we want to kind of start taking over control of the business. So we can trade in our preferred stock and get common stock. A couple of examples we need to walk through there. <clears throat> preferred stock with a conversion feature. What does that mean? Well, if we issue preferred stock and we say, we stamp on there, it's a buck per share par value, we issue 5000 and let's just say we get exactly $5,000. Fine. The journal entry is not too complicated. There's the cash. We would call this convertible preferred stock. We say par value, 5,000 shares. And generally speaking, if it's preferred stock, we can stamp on there whatever the par value is whenever we feel like it. Usually we don't have to necessarily register with the, the uh, state what the par value is. Um, but that's just a way of like, we just want to raise some extra money, but these people are not going to try to control the business. They just want a little bit of a dividend. So we issue those things, boom, there it is. No common stock, no paid in capital. What is the journal entry if they convert? Now this is where it's a little bit complicated. So again, it's going to follow along with me here. People who own 5,000 preferred shares are able to convert them into um, common common shares at a ratio of 
6.25 preferred shares for one common share. So you have to own quite a bit of preferred stock in this case if you want at least one share um, of the business. So that's usually the case. Preferred shares, you have to have a lot of them. You have to can turn it in a lot of them to get one share because we're talking about ownership at this point, going from passive to active investing. So how do you do this? Quite simply, there's the algebra right there. Here's the here's just what you need to do. Multiply the 6.25 preferred stock per one common share. That's the ratio. Multiply that 6.25 times the number of shares that are being turned in. 800 shares of common are being issued out there. What's the journal entry? Well, that was the um, that's the balance that we're emptying out. If we're, if we're emptying out the preferred shares, it's going to be a debit to the preferred stock. That's your step one. Your step two is figure out how much common based on the par value per share. One cent per 800 shares in this case. The remaining plug figure is the additional paid in capital, 492. So it's very similar to what we've seen before. It's just a little bit of math you have to do here. So I just sort of recommend, I'm giving you practice on this, multiply the conversion ratio. Preferred stock over common stock. Multiply that ratio whatever that is, by the number of shares being turned in, traded in 5,000, that determines how many new shares are being issued out there. If you have trouble with that, come and talk to me. I don't want it to make it more complicated than it is, but sometimes people get that ratio mixed up, so just make sure you understand how to do that. It still is a matter of emptying out the preferred, convertible preferred to make that go to zero. That is what's determining how much is going to par and then how much is going to APEC in my case. This exam we just had, uh, you know, talk to me about it regardless of how you did. Some people kind of look at this exam and say, wow, I really bombed it. And I say, everyone has a bad exam. Okay, so don't think that if you scored below the average, don't beat yourself up about it. Let's talk about what your questions you missed. Um, 70% was the average. You had about three students who scored above 100% or equal to or above 100%. Homework this week is not due until Thursday. So if you have time, I recommend working on extra credit. About 45% of students have started that extra credit assignment. Um, of those people, 27% have scored at least 70%. So they'll be getting some points. 61% of those people have already scored 95. So they'll get the full 20 points in that case. In the case, if you um, if you don't get all the extra credit points, um, don't feel bad. Usually, I do an, a midterm exam replacement. If your final exam percentage is higher than your worst midterm percentage, okay, then all your lowest midterm percentage will be replaced with whatever your final exam percentage is. We'll talk about that. If your final exam is your worst exam, then there's no effect at all in this case. You can only benefit from this exam replacement. Last semester about 89% of my students actually benefited from this. That's why I like to do it. <clears throat> so here's how it works. Assume for example that um, your final exam you get 73% on your final but your worst midterm was say a 65. In that case because your final exam is higher okay, that's just your percentage what I would do in that case is I would say, okay, I would get rid of the 65% from your midterm. And I'd say, ah, eh, just go ahead and give them the 73% on that midterm. Okay, so I would overwrite the percentage and say 73% times 60. Rather than 65% times 60, I would say, no, no, no. You actually earned 44 points, not 39. That's an exam replacement. Okay, I give you some extra points on your added to your worst midterm exam. In the case where you your let's just say that your final exam is 73 but your lowest midterm was 80%. Does that hurt you? No, it doesn't. Okay? I would just basically leave those as is. They would be the same as you would see up above. So that's the midterm exam replacement. If you want to go through the calculations that come see me. Happy to do that for you. That's a midterm exam replacement. It will benefit you. You don't have to do anything other than just try to kick ass on the final exam. 